everybody thanks so much for joining us for our live lecture this evening um let me share our first set of slides um <clears throat> we would like to share with you this evening the topic of the fashioned body which is a collaborative lecture that myself and my four colleagues have devised for you this evening we're looking at the concept of the fashioned body and really thinking about what the relationships are between fashion and the body. My name is Emma Dick and I'm Director of Programmes of Fashion at Middlesex University and I'm a Senior Lecturer in Fashion Visual Cultures. I've recorded a little segment from our colleague Katie Harrison, who unfortunately can't be here live this evening, but we're going to present part of her work. Luke, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi everyone, my name is Luke Rinney. I'm a year two uh, tutor for fashion textiles and design. Alan? Hi everyone, my name is Alan Davis. I am a lecturer on the fashion communications and styling course and with a specialization in photography. And Joe? Hi everyone, um, I'm the program leader for fashion design. Um, I'm also uh, the lecturer for um, mostly the final year and final collection uh, students. Thanks so much. So we're really pleased that you're all here. As you've noticed, there is four different programmes or subjects on the screen. So tonight's lecture covers all of them. We know that some of you will be interested in studying fashion design. Some will be interested in fashion textiles and design. Some of you, fashion communication and styling. Maybe some of you are interested in the fashion foundation year. And the subject that I teach is called fashion visual cultures. And it's the kind of contextual element that binds all of the programs together. So tonight's lecture is in five sections, two of them short, three of them a bit longer. I'm gonna give a little introduction about fashion and the body. Then I'm going to play you a short video from Katie, who's unfortunately not here, and she is going to share with us her expertise on historic costume making and think about emphatic femininity and how the ideas of the female body have been shaped through corsetry. Then Luke is going to present to us some of his work. He's thinking about communicative textiles and the role that textiles play in communicating ideas about protecting and defending everybody. And Alan is going to talk about their photographic practice in analogue and digital work and thinking about the idea of non-binary, non-bodies, communicating bodies, representing ideas about the body. And Joe is going to finish off looking a little bit about what's the future of the ideas of fashion and the body and to take any questions that any of you might have of anything that we say or anything in general about the fashion programmes. So I am going to start with a very short introduction, not by myself, but by a book that we might ask you to read a section from in the first year or the second year of your study at Middlesex University. This is a wonderful, wonderful book by Joanne Entwistle. She's a sociologist. So we understand that fashion is such a social um, topic. It really interacts with all of our daily lives. And a book such as The Fashioned Body by Joanne Entwistle really helps us to understand the history and the social context of what the body means in contemporary society and how fashion and the body interact. So I'm simply going to read you the very first page from Joanne Entwistle's book because I think it really nicely contextualizes what we are going to present to you this evening. So she says, fashion is about bodies. It is produced, promoted, and worn by bodies. It is the body that fashion speaks to, and it is the body that must be dressed in almost all social encounters. Within the West, and increasingly beyond as well, fashion structures much of our experience of dress. Although, as I argue in this book, it is not the only factor influencing dress in everyday life, since other factors such as sex, class, income and tradition play their part. Fashionable dress is dress that embodies the latest aesthetic. It is dress defined at a given moment 
as desirable, beautiful and popular. In articulating the latest aesthetic and in making available certain kinds of clothes, fashion provides the raw material of daily dress produced by a multitude of bodies operating across a variety of sites. Understanding fashion requires understanding the relationship between these different bodies operating within the fashion system. Fashion colleges and students, designers and design houses, tailors and seamstresses, models and photographers, as well as fashion editors, distributors, retailers, fashion buyers, shops and consumers. In other words, studying fashion involves moving from production to distribution and consumption. Without the countless seamstresses and tailors, there would be no clothes to consume. Without the promotion of fashion by cultural intermediaries, such as fashion journalists, fashion as the latest style would not be transmitted very far. And without the acceptance of consumers, fashionable dress would lie unworn in factories, shops and wardrobes. Thus, when we speak of fashion, we speak simultaneously of a number of overlapping and interconnecting bodies involved in the production and promotion of dress, as well as the actions of individuals acting on their bodies when getting dressed. Okay, so that's very much the ethos that we present to you today overlapping and interconnecting bodies, giving you different perspectives on fashion and the body. I'm going to start with a little clip that I recorded earlier this morning with Katie Harrison, our Senior Fashion Textile Technician. Just give me one moment, I will swap to the video. Katie's really sorry that she couldn't be here live with us this evening, but I hope you'll be able to really enjoy her pre-recorded clip. All right. <laughs> um, whoops. So, hello, I'm Catherine Harrison. I'm a um, senior technician um, in fashion design at Middlesex University on the fashion uh, BA. So, um, I'm going to chat a little bit today about corsetry and how it manipulates the silhouette um, in uh, throughout history. So, I'll just touch on a couple of areas to, um, to have a look at. So. Um, yeah, generally looking at uh, corsets and stays, I'll sort of go into what corsets, what the difference is um, in the next slide. Um, but um, yeah, they're obviously constructed to control the body and um, alter its natural shape, um, producing like, a new or altered silhouette. So I guess depending on um, the styles of the time, um, it will be emphasizing the hips more or the bust more, it might be flattening the bust, um, narrowing the hips, um, pushing the bust up, like, um, all, you know, throughout um, history, the body's been manipulated in different ways through corsetry. So, um, yeah, I think um, in the 19th century, um, standard sizing was introduced in corsetry. Um, which sort of started the ready-to-wear market in fashion a little bit there. Um, so I think around 1860. But um, the shape of the corset became a little bit more uniform in the 19th century and it looks more like what we'd expect to see today um, in a in contemporary corsetry. Um, yeah, so... Oh, it's interesting to note actually that um, the female body shapes are now proportionally very different um, because we don't wear corsets on a regular basis. And actually, um, before the 20th century, you know, women and children and some men as well, um, it was fashionable to wear corsets. So bodies were used to being controlled and restricted um, in, in that sense. So actually, it, it brought out quite a different body shape um, than what we've, we're used to today. So, yeah, looking at men's, men wearing corsetry. So, um, yeah, it became quite popular in the 19th century from about 1820 um, because the silhouette was very fitted, um, which was uh, mostly sort of very fitted tailoring. 
which was also really structured as well. So that's where I sort of work in tailoring and corsetry. So you look at how silhouette can be altered through corsetry, through sort of restricting the body, but then through tailoring by building on top. Um, so yeah, men um, at this time sort of used both to bring the waist in and bring the shoulders out and the chest out. Um, so yeah, it, it played a key role there. Um, I think that's a riding coat example there. So that sort of time period. Um, yeah, so the difference between stays and corsets, you might hear these words, you know, you can obviously you can call a stay a corset, we know what a corset is now, but before the 18th, 18th century and earlier, corsets were actually called stays. So um, it's, it means to like hold the body, um, a stay um, can refer to just a bone or like the corset themselves itself. It was called a pair of stays because it was done in two halves. So this one here, um, you can see there's like seam down the centre front there. So the corset would be made in two halves and then joined on the centre front. Um, and later styles <coughs> um, in the 19th century look more like this one here on the right, which is more like what we would expect to see from corset today. I think, although this 18th century style is really popular at the moment. Um, so yeah, other terminology, pair of bodies, jumps, and a bodice, they all mean slightly different things. So we just use corset as a generic term now. Um, there's a lot of information here. This is a slide just from one of the presentations that I show um, about um, internal garment construction in general, but like the, the term stay can refer to all these different things so um which all control well the silhouette of the garment the shape of the garment and the body to some extent so you've got harnesses underwires like just a simple tie around the leg or like an integrated corset and air panniers as well um yeah jumping ahead to this slide i've got um a petticoat and crinoline here that are made using boning to create that um, external structure to the body. So it's not so much using it to restrict, it's using it to build a structure as well. So I know that you're asking about boning types, Emma, but this is another slide from a presentation um, that I use for teaching just to show the different types. I won't go into too much detail. Um, but yeah, you've got flexible Rigeline synthetic whalebone, which you would use more for historical shapes and the styles that I'm discussing at the moment because it behaves the same as whalebone would have done in the sense that if you use whalebone, it would actually mould to the shape of the wearer's body. So it would keep its silhouette. Um, so when you put it back on again, it's more comfortable than it is when you first try it on because it's then like molded to your shape. Um, and other types of boning here are like steel based, metal based boning. Um, you'd see the spiral boning more in um, contemporary corsets where you're using stretch. Um, so moving on to these, just picked out a couple of examples of historical shapes um, to look at. So in um, the mid 18th century, you've got this um, sort of flat front, like very flat fronted corset, where everything would be pushed right up at the front, your bust would be pushed up high, and the bones were actually it was solidly boned throughout the corset. So <clears throat> it took a long time to make and provided a lot of support and a lot of restriction, I think, on the body. Um, so at, the, at that time, corset makers thought that the amount of bone that you use equals the amount of support that you get. Um, um, so this is the, an example of one that I've made of that type. 
yeah, you can see here the bones are like solidly throughout the bodice. So it's really, um, yeah, solid when you pick it up quite and quite um, restricted to the wearer. So we do like um, in costume space them out more to sort of give the same silhouette, but make the corset a little bit lighter weight and more comfortable to wear using the synthetic whalebone usually. Um, so yeah, moving forward to 1770s, they sort of discovered that you didn't need to fully bone a bodice and you could leave spaces and still get the same effect. So this is when comfort, I suppose, came more into corsetry, um, where you've got these spaces just of fabric, which makes the corset a lot easier to wear. And also visually contouring the body as well. Looks more flattering, I think. Um, this, was, this is a kind of transitional corset between the two times that I made um, for an installation at the Museum of London, but it was this one was fully um, stitched by hand. So we've got areas of solid boning and areas of, of space as well. Um, so moving forward to like mid 19th century, this is a bit of a transitional corset as well from um, like to moving towards the more modern shape that we see today. But the silhouette at this time was fashionable to have your bust sitting quite close to your waist. So what we would consider probably a low position of bust at the moment is actually um, quite a bit, uh, was actually fashionable at the time. So, and it was also a time when the front busk um, was invented. So in 1960s, uh, 1860s, sorry, the um, front metal closure um, was became a thing in corsetry. And this one's a later style, again, that I showed before, that's um, just slightly longer in the waist. And um, fashionable sort of corset shapes haven't altered too much from the pattern, from this pattern. Um, so that's what we call a wasp waist corset. And this is an example um, in a film that I've made there where it's sort of sitting slightly more under bust. So it's edging again a little bit more towards waspy that we would use today. Um, so that's kind of a bit of corsetry history in a nutshell. And um, <clears throat> I've got just some examples here of, of teaching uh, work, student work um, here. So just to sort of go back again to the 18th century stays and 19th century and how this, those styles still obviously fit and work with um, the modern body. Um, and moving on here to um, complement that I've worked with the FATE collab uh, FATE which is fashion and textiles education archive so um, again like bringing it back to the original garments and having a look at how they, they were made um, and um, structured differently um, depending on the period in history. Um. So this is um, a workshop that I do with um, Middlesex. So we're just sort of producing a, a sampler. So it's a simple bustier pattern um, that uses actually all, a, a lot of the similar methods you would find in historical corsetry. We can apply that to modern um, shapes as well. So um, I don't know if you have any questions at this stage. I have. <laughs> I have a two questions. I'll summarise it down to two. I've got so many questions, Katie. Um, question one, your corset you made for the Museum of London display, how long did that take you to make? Like how many hours, days, weeks? Um, uh, good question, if I can remember. I think it was more or less about a week of solid hand sewing. Yeah. And that's all hand sewn? 
Yes, yeah. So all the um, channels were hand sewn with the back stitch. So yeah, it was it was quite um, yeah a long period of sewing the channels in before you could actually make the corset as well. And what is the material that you've used for boning in that corset? That is the synthetic whalebone. Synthetic whalebone. I love yeah. that when you said like people thought the more whalebone you put into something, the stronger it would become. But I can really, really see how as you wear something, it kind of takes on the shape of your body. It made me think of a pair of jeans nowadays. Like when you get a new pair of jeans, they're so tight and uncomfortable. And then you put it on and it gradually relaxes to fit your own body shape. So I really yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think it is, it is similar to that, isn't it? Because they're quite heavy fabrics as well. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, One other question I wanted to ask you was, could you just say, you've obviously got all this experience from like film and television work. Could you just give us a little bit of uh, understanding of the kind of role that you've, you've played here and how did you learn it? How did you learn? How did you get into costume design? Um, so um, I got into it through... Um, I studied handcraft tailoring. So after I studied um, fashion design during my BA at Brighton, and then um, I, I wanted to get more into making construction from there. So I did a handcraft tailoring apprenticeship. It was a pre-apprenticeship course with Savile Row tailors. So they kind of prepare you for going on to do an apprenticeship with the tailor. Um, so I did the course in order to learn all the hand stitching and the different stitches that they use in, in handcraft tailoring. So from there, I, I got into costume because I applied for a position as a handcraft tailor for menswear. So I was doing like a lot of like 18th and 19th century men's tailoring there. Um, and then I got more interested in the corsetry um, than the tailoring. <laughs> and um, because actually it uses a lot of similar techniques. So yeah, I moved over to corsetry from there. Um, I'm just going to make a stop on Katie's recording there because the internet went a bit funny and we lost a bit of the sound. But Katie is an amazing resource in the fashion design programme. Joe, I think you would agree. And maybe yeah, at yeah, the I end agree. of the lecture, you can maybe say a few words about how the kind of historical, very technical work that Katie does links to the contemporary design work that the students are producing as well. So it's a very, very rich resource. And being able to integrate that knowledge of fashion history into contemporary fashion, I think is so important and fantastic. We've had a couple of student questions. Um, sh should I answer these now or do you want me to? It's, it's specifically about the, the corsetry. Um, just they're from Sarah. Now, I am not a corset specialist, so I can't fully answer uh, all these questions that have come, the, the two that have come in. But um, the first one is where corsets actually harmful. Um, from as far as I know, when I've had lecture series and I've, I've done some um, training in corsetry, you actually train a, the part of the body. I don't know in terms of how, how they did it back in history, but now you can wear trainer corsets, which I believe the organs in the body slowly move upwards as you train your body in wearing the corset, um, which is no different to when a woman is having a, a, a child. It's the same process, the organs move around the body. So it's not necessarily harmful. Yes, it can hurt if you uh, overwear and, and you do it wrong, then obviously don't, don't look into it if it's something you actually want to get, because people still do train the, their bodies now um, in modern day wearing corsets. And the second question is, uh, will corsets worn by plus size individuals? Yes different sizes we cater to that as well on the on the program when we do corsetry um within the course you can do it to whatever size that you're looking to create a corset for so i hope that kind of answers the, the questions but i'm not a specialist in corsetry so <laughs> don't quote me exactly on that one <laughs> you can come and ask katie katie is a specialist yeah, yeah. katie is a specialist she would know if she was here but yeah yeah oh. Um, I think the next section we're going to move on to, uh, Luke, if you'd like to present your part of the lecture, I think what's really clear from Katie's is this idea of the physical body that we have and how the physical body is physically shaped and moulded by whalebone, by metal, by restrictive garments, etc. And Luke, you've got a, a, an interesting kind of comparison idea about the way you think about the relationship between textiles and the body. So maybe you want to start there. 
So you should be able to see your screen. Yeah, hi everyone. So um, I'm starting with um, just uh, my own practice. Uh, so, so what I what I practiced in. Um, so I, I practiced in fashion design, um, and it's. Uh, I'm starting with an image of, of a few looks from a slow fashion collection that I did a while ago after I um, had, had a label, uh, started to feel that the seasonal collections of, uh, of fashion weeks, et cetera, were becoming antiquated a bit. <laughs> and I wanted to, to take my time over, um, over creating uh, these collections. Um, and it's really nice to follow on from Katie's uh, talk with this uh, image, in a sense, because um, I can say the uh, the my piece with the um, daffodil at the top, uh, that's actually got a corset engineered into it. So I built um, a top around a corset, uh, but I did want I wanted the top to stand away from the body. So if if she moves to the side, uh, you'd see it uh, stood away from the body, and. <laughs> I, I really wanted the corset to be invisible. So it's, a, uh, it's another way of introducing um, that molding of the body um, into something where I was actually, I didn't want that to be uh, what I was celebrating within this piece. It was, for me, it was all about the textiles. And I see a lot of my work um, being all about textiles. So I, I work a lot with uh, cloth intarsia and that's a technique. Uh, it's, a, it's a creative pattern cutting and sewing technique in which, uh, you uh, cut and stitch into each uh, pattern piece to create uh, an image or a collage of fabric. Um, I was showing during London Fashion Week and this is uh, one season. Uh, again, my work uh, was always about, so uh, there was nothing that had you know, one, one item, one part, one piece of fabric in a look. Uh, I was always wanting to mix fabrics uh, get a real uh, sense of texture through fabrications that create textiles themselves. Um, I did do screen printing, so I did a lot of screen printing. Um, I've got knitwear, <laughs> embroidery uh, within my past collections. Uh, I, for this collection, I worked with Andrew Logan, uh, a sculptor and, and des jewelry designer, as well as Christian Lacroix and got um, funding for uh, fabric and um, fabric collaborations, etc. Um, so I, re I really want, I always wanted uh, to celebrate the, the textiles and the body almost come, it came secondary to that for me. <laughs> for me, it was always about the fabrication. Uh, and again, another, another uh, collection in which I um, used a hand stitch a lot within. <laughs> also, um, this was a quite a sustainable collection. Uh, as all my denim I got uh, donated from Levi's and my uh, leather was donated from Chloe and Celine in Paris. Um, I, th I then took that technique of cloth intarsia, intarsia and that technique of stitching into something uh, and then took it onto more pedestrian style um, uh, clothing. <laughs> I think uh, I tried paired tra I paired with a charity in America called the Trans Women of Color Collective to raise money and funds in aiding uh, against transphobia. And so these again, are, these are Jersey t-shirts with Jersey that's been stitched into it uh, to create these images. So they're not prints, they're not embroideries. Um, then uh, moved on to larger uh, textile pieces. So, so large textile pieces using this same technique to create uh, texture, to create imagery uh, within a textile piece. I'm going to do a small, small case study about G's Ben. So my, doing those two pieces uh, led, has, has really led me to a new, a new research uh, output, which is researching into G's Bend, which if you haven't heard of G's Bend, and if you if you Google G's Bend, you'll see all these wonderful graphic quilts. <laughs> and if you're anything like me, when I first looked into G's Bend, I thought G's Bend was a person, but it's not. <laughs> it's a town uh, in 
deep south uh, rural Alabama in America. Um, and since the 19th century, quilts have been made and created and designed uh, to be used uh, for cover covering for warmth, for covering slats in, in floors uh, and, and on walls of wooden houses um, against the you know harsh winters of Alabama. Uh, these quilts <laughs> were made uh, before the civil rights movement. So the reason that's important is you can see there's a lot of color, there's a lot of, of kind of joy <laughs> in, in these quilts. And it's almost uh, a, represent a representation of a community that are fighting against something through textiles. Uh, <laughs> And Geez Ben can argue, arguably be called uh, trailblazers of sustainability, as well as storytelling through their quilts. Can you explain a little bit more, Luke? Why are you, why did you say that? In sustainability, yeah, yeah. So, so these women, uh, I've got a page here just of these, these women. So these, these women are <laughs> generations of women that are, um, are quilters. So these are the women of the town of Gee's Bend. So when you look at a Gee's Bend quilt, it's made by a woman from that town or it's made by a family or a few friends that sit around and make that quilt. And the, the reason I uh, su suggest that they're trailblazers in sustainability is because a lot, lot, lot of their quilts were made from old clothes, <laughs> which is something we uh, at Middlesex encourage as well, uh, being sustainable in trying to really repurpose old clothes. And um, we've just done a competition uh, this year uh, of, of an alter eco project. <laughs> So, so um, a lot of these quilts, yeah, they were they were made using old jeans, old feed sacks, all the all of these uh, clothes that that tell stories in a sense. As you can see, there's impressions of bodies, uh, knees, elbows, pockets that have been um, misplaced, um, and they all kind of they tell stories of, of a wearer, but they tell stories of the body um, that was wearing those clothes as well. I've just got a quote from Prima Sohan that notes that needlework does not function as an alternative to discourse, but as a form of discourse. That is, we think of the needle as, as the pen. It's a form of rhetoric with the potential to shape identity, build community and prompt engagement with social action. The reason I wholeheartedly believe in, in this quote is uh, I see, I myself always said I was, I was I'm, I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a, drawer. Uh, I, I don't sit in, I can't, I'm, you know, I'm not a very uh, efficient at, at just sitting and drawing, but, but I, I, when I get on a machine, I can create texture and I do see the sewing machine as my, my pen, as my medium. I always say I, I saw it as my paintbrush and palette was a sewing machine on my fabric. Um, and then uh, I just wanted to talk about this, the, the American flag shirt. It's just in the sense of once you introduce a textile to the body, it changes what that, how, the way in which that textile can be, can be and will be perceived as it has here. And the, the best way to show you, uh, or the best example of, of this is that during the Vietnam War uh, in America, uh, American flag clothing uh, became increasingly popular as a form of protest to the war. And an activist, Abby Hoffman, uh, was arrested and charged with discretion of the flag whilst protesting um, in 1968. So the, the idea of this flag being on his body, um, him wearing it as a shirt, if he was protesting and holding a flag, it, I don't think it, well, it wouldn't have got the same, uh, the arrest wouldn't have happened. But once you introduce a textile onto the body, it becomes something completely different. And that's the same for you know, lots of other, uh, lots of garments in themselves as well, just as it is the other way around with the, with the trousers being made into quilts, introducing um, from the body to a, a flat piece shows um, another element. And I'm just uh, going to finish on uh, some of my, my practice that I'm uh, that I work, work on at the minute, which is um, within a fine art context. So I start with collage and then I, um, I kind of disintegrate that collage into a, a digital print 
so blowing up and then create uh, pattern pieces to re replace elements of that collage with plain fab fabrics and those uh, fabrics are then stitched in using the cloth and tarsier technique as you can see here <laughs> um, so it's again it's about uh, it's about taking taking apart something and and replacing and how that um how that links or doesn't link to the, to the notion of the fashioning of the body Look, thank you so much. It's really, really beautiful to see all the different examples of your work and to, to think about that relationship between textiles and the body, as you've so beautifully explained. I really, really like this metaphor of sewing machine as a tool and a needlework as a form of discourse. I think that's really, really powerful. And I think at the end, what you're really talking about there is that um, the relationship between bodies and textiles, bodies and clothes, whether the bodies are there or not, and that different meaning it takes. Mm. I think if we move to Alan, your section of the lecture, you're kind of taking that into another dimension almost, where you're looking at photography as a tool, photography as a medium, and you're beginning to think about representations of those bodies and, and how that works with your practice. So maybe you could introduce your practice to us, please. Sure, thanks, Emma. Uh, welcome everyone. Um, as I mentioned earlier, my name is Alan Davis and I teach on the fashion communications um, pathway. Um, so I just want to introduce some of the work which I do. I work as a photographer, um, but also a production designer across the mediums of fashion photography and also music imagery and music videos as well. And I've also worked using costume props to um, alter the silhouette of the body, um, as well as change some of the stereotypical gender norms of what uh, fashion can be considered for use within the body. Um, I'm very much interested in the idea that costume can also blur the boundaries between fashion as well. Um, and that kind of use of imagery is, is a very interesting kind of like format for me to work with. Um, I've worked with a lot of different uh, musicians on music videos where the production of imagery has blended um, physical set design as well as 3D manipulated um, animation. Um, for instance, a music video for LaRue um, and also working with artists such as FK Twigs, um, which uh, slight uh, random link, but actually a lot of corsetry was used on that uh, photo shoot as well um, to link in with Katie's lecture. Um, but then I also have moved on to very recently completing a master's in photography, contemporary dialogues. Uh, which spaced uh, the, the production of uh, before the pandemic and then completing it as just at the end of uh, one of the lockdowns last year. Um, and a lot of the kind of inspiration around that time was based on uh, the connections that I had in the very sort of short periods of uh, freedom of, of lockdown uh, windows um, and using analog photography to record connections with uh, friends and colleagues that I would have opportunities to, to photograph. And what I became aware of at the time was that when we document people in photography, we also create what then becomes an effective archive. Um, the imagery that is produced creates a, a record of the people that we're um, photographing. Um, and I was very much interested in this kind of very tactile approach to analog photography, um, whilst also reading a lot of theorists around this, uh, such, as, such as Bretta Ettinger's uh, The Matri Matrixial Border Space, um, which is very interesting kind of uh, connotations of digital and analog uh, boundaries that are blurred when we start to digitize analog imagery. Um, and so a lot of this work was produced at this time, but then showcased, um, especially through 
as we're talking now, um, digital formats such as Zoom and also Teams. Um, and it was very interesting to see how that translated into what I then uh, created and thought of as a memory palace. Um, so using a three-dimensional software uh, programs such as SketchUp and also Blender to then showcase those analog images, but in a digital 3D space. And this brought up quite a lot of kind of very interesting kind of questions about kind of what what does this kind of like form? What is that body of work that then is in essentially a digital space? And how do we view that? Um, and I was working a lot with the a virtual reality, such as um, the Oculus headsets uh, to then showcase that. So when you'd wear the headset, you would actually be immersed in that environment of analog, but digital imagery. <clears throat> Um, and just to set some uh, context in terms of history, um, I wanted to just read this quote, which is, while well, historians generally accept that the first photographic camera was developed in 1860 by the Frenchman Joseph Nisiphorus, and yet this camera originally relied on centuries of contributions as he created photographic images onto silver chloride lined paper and on oldest extant photographer was one that was made around 1826. Um, and also looking at the original formats of the camera obscura, which uh, essentially means a dark chamber, uh, which is the origins of the camera in, in essence, um, where if you, and you can create this yourself, if you'd like to experiment with it, if you created a pinhole in a box, you'd essentially, with the light that would go through that hole, would be projected, but in reverse on the opposite side. Um, and this was the, the beginnings of how we can start to see how documentation of people and bodies within physical spaces or rooms, such as the camera obscura can be uh, recorded. And then I went on to, to work with uh, Middlesex. And for me, it was a very interesting kind of like format to start considering how we create imagery and that becomes a record of the body and how we can also use that as a format to deconstruct that as well. Um, so I really wanted to kind of look at the deconstruction of essentially the binary fashion system um, and working with the students then to, to work on what was essentially the uh, one of the first kind of like terms of this project um, which was named uh, non-binary perspectives um, and a lot of illustration and collage was produced to kind of really question what we consider as stereotypes of what would be femininity or also masculinity and what happens if we start to kind of actually mix those together blend them or use alternative costume props to really kind of push those boundaries and these projects took uh, lots of workshop formats. So the students got options to uh, experiment with not only photography, but also with their styling projects that they work on, because there's lots of pathways on the fashion communication uh, course. You work with photography, styling. Um, you can essentially kind of uh, work with hair, makeup, collage, imagery. Um, and when we start to actually bring all of those things together, it was a really kind of interesting format for the students to explore what they can create as a format of, uh, of gender identities or non-gender identities in, in this case as well. Um, and it became quite a very kind of like performative element with the students as well. Um, some of the students, uh, not only were they um, photography, uh, students, but they were also becoming kind of models within their own artwork. They were producing imagery that uh, collaborated with other stylists outside of Middlesex or potentially through um, internal uh, collaborations as well. Um, and it was a very kind of a fundamental process for the students to consider what their style and image making would become. Um, 
But then we also we had the second part to the project where we started to consider the imagery, uh, not just through the lens of a, a single lensed camera, but what happens if we start to think of it in terms of three dimensional formats. Um, and the the virtual reality headset was actually uh, first kind of created around 1968. Um, and that was a kind of process which I wanted to look at for creating imagery that we can then utilize in terms of viewing it um, and seeing it in a different space, in a kind of digital three-dimensional space. <clears throat> so we started to use uh, applications such as Polycam, which is a free application. You can download it and explore this yourself. It's a very user-friendly format, and it uses a system called LiDAR, which is a pulsed laser that records time, and it takes it at a nanosecond speed so that the single uh, that it would return to the source enables you to generate a 3D model with greater accuracy than just a single camera ever could, um, which is a really interesting kind of process. It sounds very technical, but the students actually brought themselves into it um, in a very kind of interesting way. Um, and we looked at uh, previous fashion photographers that were already working in this kind of like format back as far as uh, the early 2000s. Um, a, a significant photographer such as Nick Knight had done uh, 3D renders of the model uh, Naomi Campbell at the time. Um, but again, this was very kind of uh, quite elaborate software at the time and now we have the ability to use essentially just your your own phones um, to record that so it's a lot more accessible um, and we have a lot more opportunities to be able to to engage with that <clears throat> um, and also the contemporary uh, photographer and video maker Jam Sutton who not only scans their models using these formats but then also creates three-dimensional printed artwork through um, three-dimensional uh, printers. Um, so then it kind of almost goes 360 in the sense of digitizing the body through these processes, but then also recreating it as sculpture as well. Um, so some of the outcomes that the students had, uh, which is experimenting with Polycam, but also with the Photoshop 3D space, to essentially recontextualize how we view the human body and how we can take the body's form out of social expectations with futuristic modern processes and, and essentially create new storylines that we can develop. Um, but this obviously doesn't uh, mean that this isn't uh, uh, a process that can't be affected in negative ways as well. So it's a very interesting way that the students now on this course are able to actually kind of like own that process and own those those storylines. Um, it's very easy for something which becomes technical to essentially be driven by very um, one system based kind of like format. Uh, so I think it's really good to have intersectionality and diversity within all of these processes. And some of the scan ex experiments I'll just show to you now. So these are students in class that were able to actually scan and document the bodies. Um, and what happens then is that you get a whole render of the physical body and you can essentially create um, videos or documentation in your own way with the imagery that is produced. Not only can you scan bodies, but you can also scan physical spaces as well. We also used uh, the program Gravity Sketch, uh, which is built into the formats of the Oculus headset. Um, and this allowed students to sketch uh, fashion products or fashion objects, um, and then recreate them in essentially a very quick format, but in a, a 3D physical space. Um, and we're very much inspired by some of the um, digital artwork by J.W. Anderson, who's been using them as kind of very uh, a much more refined, but final kind of like outcomes for um, fashion promotion currently. So it's something which we're very interested in, in developing and seeing this as, a, as another process for the students. 
Um, they also experimented with uh, 3D augmented reality applications such as Dress X, um, which essentially creates three-dimensional fashion for the body and then can be worn in augmented reality applications um, such as uh, social media, but also on uh, built-in applications on the phone and uh, some di differential uh, of images from the polycam there as well. <clears throat> and all, all this kind of combined together sort of opened up the question of, and a very kind of buzzword from last year, um, not to kind of quote it under Mark, uh, Mark Zuckerberg, uh, but the metaverse, which actually was uh, a collection or a network of 3D virtual worlds, which focuses on social connection and in futurism and science fiction, it is often described as the hypothetical iteration of the internet as a single universal virtual world that is facilitated by the use of virtual and augmented reality headsets. Um, and I think it was a really interesting kind of way to start the students thinking of how this 3D digital bodies and, and work that they were producing can actually then be showcased. Um, we're also looking at um, a lot of gaming apps at the time that were working with fashion brands and the collaboration of Fortnite with Balenciaga was a big inspiration for a lot of the students at the time and how we can essentially create kind of new realms to inhabit with these digital worlds, um, something which is growing on a daily basis. Um, and I see a lot of this as tools for that we can use like in, in the sense how we currently use the internet um, or we would use social media, not as a replacement from existing um, as this would be the secret rave. I'm sure we all still want to go to secret raves. Um, but the, um, the project kind of then pushed further into the ideas and uh, concepts of NFTs. Um, and this one student uh, had produced a collaboration or a hypothetical collaboration between Gucci um, and uh, kind of NFTs of the metaverse of the, Gu the Gucci verse as it was. Um, so, but rather than the very kind of like slick versions of some of the CGI work that we've seen, um, it was almost like going back to the lo-fi for the NFTs um, and, uh, Although this was imagery that already exists from Gucci, it was still a very interesting example of how the students had engaged with um, using that imagery, but then essentially creating a new body of work um, that uh, essentially collaborates between existing photography and then also bringing it back into lo-fi uh, digital illustration and animation. And for to kind of conclude that i really think that the digital fashion body has a, a way to transgress cultural social systems and has the potential to move beyond the gender binary um, but obviously this does have risks to it and i think that's something that we have to consider uh, whenever anyone creates imagery within the fashion world we have a, a social responsibility how do we create something that is um, unique, but also has uh, a sense of ethics to it? And that's something which uh, at Middlesex we consider through lots of documentation, lots of communication and uh, discussions around that. Um, and I think there is another part from Joe. So thank you, everyone. <laughs> Thanks so much, Alan. So thought provoking. And I definitely want to go to a secret rave. <laughs> definitely. Um, Joe, the floor is yours. Yeah. Do we still have, have, have time or did you want to see if there was any? Yeah, we still got some time. Yeah, I think just show the last image. OK, I'll be really quick because I know we haven't got much time left. Um, I just wanted to kind of contextualise what everyone's doing because I think a nice follow on for, from what Alan's spoken about um, is uh, uh, from fashion design point of view, um, we are really working towards um, three <laughs> practice as well. 
Um, and if we look back at what Katie um, spoke about in terms of corsetry, those hand techniques, we're now looking at how do we emulate those in three three dimensional forms using CLO 3D technology. Um, now this one doesn't actually have uh, a corsetry in, uh, but this is an example of a, a recent graduate's work that um, completed his entire final collection on um, the uh, dig using digital software called uh, CLO 3D, which is much more taking um, uh, 2D pattern pieces into, into the computer, creating them in the computer, and then uh, generating uh, digital outcomes um, using that software. So all this these designs were completely made um, digitally. Um, he did uh, make some of them in, um, in twirl in, 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 in basic forms as well to see if they actually worked. And a lot of our final year students now are, are finding this really interesting balance between um, being hands-on hands, hands -on physical and going back into designing and creating digital as well. And that transition between the two and how they both work is kind of how the, I think the future of our course and what our students are interested in is moving towards. And just to kind of contextualize again, what Katie really spoke about that hands-on aspect, it also transfers again back into that digital um, kind of universe as well. Just as a little side note to what we're also doing on uh, fashion design. But yeah, just a quick nod to that. It's wonder it's really wonderful to see that work again, Joe. Are there any Q and A in the um No, I don't know if anyone has um if they do want to type any questions in and I think there's a little bit of time if anyone's got any questions across any of the presentations that have, have taken Ooh. place. I, I answered the the core street ones, which were great, but if there's any other questions, feel free. I did see someone's hand raised previously, but I have no clue how, uh, apologies, how to, um, uh, to to ask who it was. I didn't know how to find out. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and also we can't ask um, names. Oh. Um, so has their hand raised. Oh, who did, say? Fam So. Oh, have you found it? Yeah, if you want to, type, I don't think you can speak to us. We can't hear anyone in the room, but if you want to type, I can uh, read out your question if there was a specific question that you wanted to ask. Uh, Sam, if you want to unmute yourself, you may be able to talk. I might have lost them. <laughs> I'm trying to see if I can unmute you, but I can't. But uh, you should be able to unmute yourself, um, can you? Yeah, I believe so. Okay, it's probably a problem there. So. Oh, or type your question if you can't. Type your question if there is one. Type your question into the QA. We'll wait for it. And anyone else that has any questions at all, either on what we presented just now, or it might just be a general question about the course or fashion. I just, I have, I do have one question. Can I just ask, um, Alan, on what um, level students were you work were you showing? I'm really interested because it's a really, a really good presentation of what what what's done. I'm just intrigued. <laughs> they're, they're all first years. Um, Amazing. I, I've only taught first years and a little bit of second years so far. Um, but yeah, I was, I was very impressed with the level of work that the, the students um, have produced. Uh, it's a second term project. So uh, most of the work that you saw was handed in literally this week. Uh, so it's, uh, it's yeah, they, they'd had a, a photography project, which was more um, simplistic like more of an editorial project first so they got the, the groundings the basis of photography but then we we took it to the next level to really kind of take it on to uh digital imagery and in a much more broader sense as well yeah. Yeah. thanks very impressive i just see in the front there's a there's an option to promote fam to panelist z will that allow them to speak 
or is that dangerous? I don't know if we should be experimenting. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to give it a try. If you want to ask the question, then we can try. Oh, God, I see that option actually now. Do you want me to try? I don't want to put you yeah, on the You spot. can try, you can try, yeah. Emma. Uh, um, if you don't want to be on screen, if you don't want your image on screen, just don't allow your camera on, but I hope it will allow you to speak. Let's try. No, nothing's happened. Yeah, nothing's happened. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. <clears throat> Um, and is there any other questions that anyone else wants to ask or type or? No. I mean, I've got loads, but I, 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 I feel like. <laughs> you can ask away, Joe, ask anything you want. Um, can I, oh, here we go. What are the grade requirements for this course? Um, I think all the information is through the admissions team. It's probably best to double check back with the admin team for each specific course. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head. I cannot, I cannot remember, but um, it's all on the through, through the ad admissions. The most important thing I would say is um, obviously the grades are really important if, if you're I don't know if you're interested in fashion design so I'm speaking from fashion design um aspect is the portfolio is really key for us on fashion design um and if you are interested what what out of interest what course are you interested in are you able to type that down for me or or is it just in general because I think we all speak that the the portfolio can sometimes really speak a lot more for then sometimes the grades are probably um, just in general. Yeah, it's portfolio, really work on that portfolio, really have a look at um, uh, what we do, what each course is required, um, you know, and showcase who you are and what you wanna bring to the table. I think that's one of the key things at Middlesex, it's about discovering mm -hmm. what you're interested in. So, um, so yeah. Um, and then Amy says, I hope that answers the question. Um, amazing seeing representation being non-binary myself is amazing to see others and you know there's something that every, each course really um, um, represents and, and stands for quite proudly and we really um, we listen to our cohort our cohort kind of tells us what we should be doing what they want who they are what they stand for what they believe in so um, we, we appreciate that feedback and um, the students will also appreciate it too, I'm sure. So, um, and it's in built to the majority of all of our, our programs. So um, yeah, yeah, I hope that answers that one. Um, but anything else from anyone? I don't know if it's interesting, but I could show just the very simple slides on portfolio presentation, if anyone wants to see them. Like if anyone's interested in portfolio, yeah, if you've got them, Emma, just, yeah, they're just they're the generic slides that we would normally show you at like an open day or something. So I can show you just the ones. They're very, very straightforward. But just if anyone's a bit curious. OK, so we've got like preparing your fashion portfolio just so that you can get an idea of the level of what kind of fashion graduate work might look like. You see uh, an example of, again, fashion textiles, fashion communication and styling and fashion design graduates the film in the middle there from one of our FCS graduates, Joel Clausio. Um, your portfolio is a collection of your creative work that introduces you and explains your approach, your interest and your skills. It should be at least 20 pages long and include a variety of work. It should show your interest in and knowledge of the area of fashion that you're applying for. Okay, so whether fashion design, fashion textiles or fashion communication and styling, they can be physical books or binders, no larger than A3. If you're submitting it online, portfolios can be digital and submitted as a single PDF document. And we would expect to see a variety of visual work that may be made up of different projects that you've undertaken at GCSE, A-level, BTEC, foundation course or similar. And they might include any independently created work that you've got as well. Like just go for broke and feel, feel proud to kind of um, show us your best work, show us what you think is most uniquely yours. Uh, there you go. So here's some examples that you can look at just so that you can see 
what we're looking for is a keen interest in fashion, examples of research and design development, examples of the breadth of your skills, willingness to experiment and take creative risks, evidence of your own interests within art and design, and most importantly, it's really about the ability to document what you're doing and the ability to communicate that. If you can show us that in approximately 20 pages of your most kind of proud pieces of work, that's what we're looking for. So there's some examples of fashion design portfolios, just to let you see some really lovely images that we've received from students. There's some fashion textiles and designs, so maybe more kind of uh, gestural work, sculptural work, some gorgeous collage there, and some examples of fashion communication and styling. Okay, just by looking at that, you can get a sense of who the person is. Okay, so those are just the generic slides that we show you, but if that helped anyone, I'm, I'm pleased. Are there any final questions? I don't think so, not, no. not, not yet. There's also open days as well as Noma. Yeah, um, we're getting towards the end of the open day season, but... Is that so the next open day? Uh, it is on the 11th of June. That's yep. on a Saturday. That's the next uh, kind of summer open day. Yeah. Everybody is, is invited to book for it and, and attend. Yeah. Um, Z, do you know if people have attended this event, will they get an invite to our fashion events during the degree show? Um, could be. I'm not 100% sure about this, uh, Emma. Ah, okay. okay. Yeah. Well, that's yeah, one list. Just for anyone that's interested, if you want to come, like our degree show is going to be between the 9th to the 16th of June. And there's some events happening during that week, which um, if you've indicated an interest in coming in the future, or if you've been to an open day, or, you know, if you've been in touch with the admissions office in some form, you might get a, an invite to that you can come to our exhibition you can come to any kind of fashion shows that we might have and stuff like that and if you don't receive an invite or you really want to come just get in touch with us and we'll make sure that you get an invite to come okay we'd really welcome you to come and see the work of the graduates just now if you're if you're interested so please that's an open invitation to you all yeah, we've got a question of when will the, i think when will the courses start um, well, they usually start uh, at the end of September, don't they? Um, mm -hmm. For the first week of Freshers, Freshers Week for first years. Yeah. Um, is usually the start for the BA courses. Yeah. Yeah, all of the undergraduate courses start in September. Yeah. Anything else anyone wants to ask? No? Should we close it out? I think we we'll probably wrap up this yeah. session. It's already yeah. nearly uh, ten past six. Yeah. Uh, so thanks everybody for attending. Is there one more question? And the course is the same one. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, so this uh, session, uh, I think the students will get the recording in due course. And as I said, as always, if they need more information, they can go to course pages on our website. And then hope to see you soon, probably at Middlesex. Thank you, everybody, and have a good evening. Bye bye. Thanks so much. Thank everybody. you, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.